thank you for joining us again this week you know um the last one um i have a bit of mixed emotions about that but yeah it's been a great uh, few sessions with you very educational i've learned a lot and i believe the viewers that have been following us on this um the world of football agents and prep have learned a lot as well um again thank you just to start um last week we left people hanging we closed it off with an issue of shared sales and people have been asking what did i mean um what why did i make you give us a short answer so let's start off there um shared sales it is often said when a player signs for a club that um the club will recover the the transfer fee or a portion there of or the a large portion of the transfer fee from the player's shared sales david beckham cristiano ronaldo and 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 is it true that clubs indeed do recover transfer fees from the shirts from shared sales of a club well um no, it's a it's a great question to start with and you know i'm not uh, i certainly haven't been the lawyer that's looked across all of the different deals that adidas nike new balance puma um under armor etc have done with um with football clubs worldwide but what what i do know from the deals that i've seen from the clubs that i've spoken to from um the the brands that we work with generally is that the the way that um apparel deals are structured with between brands and clubs um is not quite akin to the usual way that you would think that relationships work effectively because um in a lot of deals and we'll use a couple of ex- exceptions to the rule um in due course but in a lot of deals what usually happens is when when someone says um you know Nike are paying um PSG or Barcelona or Liverpool or whoever it might be or Adi are paying Bayern Munich whatever else it might be that per year whatever the amount is usually that amount is effectively an advance to a degree it's an amount that will be effectively guaranteed regardless of performance usually usually yeah. which means that if Adi does pay um Bayern Munich um 40 million euros per year um that is because adidas believe that paying 40 million euros is worthwhile that they can still make um significant retail profit from munich for example and the way that that then would work is that usually and it depends on different situations if the shirt is being retailed in the munich shop if it's in the adidas online store and um, if particular thresholds are met then different situations evolve but what can be the case is that let's just use munich as the example because i don't know the munich <laughs> situation yeah. is the truth um what tends to happen is that that advance of whatever that amount might be um is paid to the club at uh, or through uh, the beginning of the season or throughout the season depending on what the commercial agreement says but then what happens is that munich will only usually or a club will only usually then profit share i e take a particular margin from shirt sales after a, shirt, a certain amount of shirt sales have been sold that's always the first thing to note so when someone says well uh, ronaldo's moved here or pogba's moved there or salah's moved there or mbappe's moved to another night or whatever else it might be it's not necessarily the case that those additional shirt sales convert into money for the club that's the first thing to say now there have been different models more recent models of um uh, uh apparel deals with clubs and liverpool is one such example because we know about more of their detail because of the court case between right. new balance and liverpool from whenever it was the towards the end of last year and the reason we know and understand the deal uh, to a degree um is because of what came out in the court case which is really interesting and any events I've really uh, impressed upon people who are in or out of law to read that case it's a in really interesting read that's available um the reason why that was interesting was because what Nike have effectively structured um it was I think it was reported that New Balance were paying over I think for 35 to 40 million pounds per year 
um, currently for Liverpool. I think, uh, if I believe it right, that Nike are actually only guaranteeing £30 million, I think that that's right, per year. But what they are effectively doing from shirt zero, i.e. from the first shirt that is sold, apparently, is that they will provide... Um, depending on the type of good, I believe it's 20% of net sales to Liverpool as well. Now, that's obviously quite a big performance um, uplift as a result. So Liverpool are happier to take a lower base guaranteed amount with the upside that sales that they make, again, it might depend on if it's a Liverpool store sale, if it's a Nike store sale, if it's online, if it's offline, there might be different margins or otherwise. But, and it might be different for merchandise, not necessarily just um, shirts, for example. But in that case, when it's more performance related, Liverpool will take more of an upside of each shirt that is sold rather than the advance and a set minimum where only then those amounts are, um, are paid to the club as a result. No, thank you for the very detailed explanation. I think we, we understand shirt sales and brand um, uh, sponsorships a bit more better. Um, speaking of that, um, I mean, it's, it's pre pretty much widespread that um, a football career is very short and agents, football players try to find an extra earning um, income stream for soccer players. Image rights is one of the most predominant um, Ending, in, income ending stream during a player's playing days. Um, something for me that's very interesting, especially in how the FA in, in England have, have um, structured the, the, their policies is that the default um, procedure or the standard procedure in player contracts that limits the use of players for marketing purposes. I think for me, that is a very direct um, or very intentional policy by the FA to provide soccer players or footballers in the, uh, playing in the EPL and extra income ending um, stream. Can you please just explain to us what the default setting is in, the, in, the, in, 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 in England and how that then affects transfers and the role it plays for football agents and soccer players? Yeah, it's again, really good one. Um, uh, I'll give you the short one and then we can go into a tiny bit more detail because it's, it's a really interesting discussion all round. The, the, the short answer is, is that for the vast majority of football players globally, never mind um, in the UK, and it might only be for a certain number of clubs in the UK, in the Premier League, maybe the top six or seven clubs, um, their players will um, have image rights companies. And the reason why that's important is the default position is you set out in the uh, EFL and EPL um, uh, employment contract is that the club can use the player's image for particular promotional activities, but they are limited to a certain extent. Um, and the reason why they, uh, the reason why then clubs might want to engage with the player's image rights company in addition to that employment contract is because they will pay an additional amount to be able to use the player's image, exploit the player's image, make sure they have certain appearances, maybe they go on pre and post season tours and then engage with particular partners, maybe the partners want to use the player's image in a club context, etc., and, and and so on and so forth. So what effectively happens is the default position is the club can use some uh, image rights um, of the player, but usually the top clubs, because they have a vast array of partners, um, a vast array of potential um, partnership opportunities, and to be able to control the player's image rights to a degree, they will, want, they will be happy to pay an additional amount for those image rights so that then when partnership arrangements come up, when um, uh, partners, club partners want to use the player's image or want to have an appearance or want to be able to show that player in particular context, club context, whatever, they, the club can exploit and use those images um, accordingly. And again, if we flip from the club side, the player's image rights company will almost certainly, if it's a, the, the boot deal is lucrative enough, it, um, contract with a number of different um, personal endorsement brands, like, for example, his boot deal or her boot deal with Nike or Addy or Puma or Under Armour or whatever else it might be. 
Um, and then they may have, you know, other types of endorsement deals if it's with, you know, skincare, hair care, personal grooming, um, uh, you know, digital brands, hair, um, hair products. It might be um, headphones, you know, it could be a range of, um, you know, different types of endorsement opportunities too. So as you hear, you know, why image rights deals become quite important when transfers happen, usually one of the issues that can arise with high profile players moving to high profile clubs is they may be endorsing a product, a partner, a brand who is a competitor of the club's partner. And therefore that is potentially an issue and a potential commercial conflict because the player of a club is endorsing a brand in competition with a partner of the club as well. And those type of things usually have to be sorted out, if possible, pre-deal or uh, arrangements to be made between the player's image rights company and the club so that, if necessary, that conflict can't continue for the, the longer term. Um, sorry, Daniel, I'm going to have to take you back to a few points in your, in your, mm. in your, in your answers. Um, Apparently, we got too technical sometimes, so I try. I would like for us to try use examples so that people can try follow on as we move. Um, the limit, the limit that the FA places on um, clubs using or exploiting players' image rights. Can we maybe use examples of players so that people can understand a bit better? And to the people that are viewing here, there's a question icon at the bottom of the screen. Please send through your questions there, and I'll ask. Daniel, um, as we move along. But just to go back to that, yeah. maybe a use of examples with the limitation so that people understand better. Yeah, it's difficult to, to give an example of, of where it would happen or not happen, but the limitation more or less is, is that the player can't be used more than the of the first team squad throughout the season. And usually they have to be um, then put together in at least two to three squad members at the same time so that it doesn't look like a personal endorsement and that it looks like a club context endorsement for a club partner whereas in um the if, if a player's image rights company contracts directly with the club then what can happen is that player can be used individually in a club context as well can be used a lot more often than just the average squad member and there can be additional restrictions and positive obligations as we've previously talked about so usually you'll see that when for example a particular set of players or players will be you know like I'll give you try and give one example like the Nivea. I'm not sure if you guys see it in South Africa, for example, but in in uh, in the UK, there's a Liverpool and Nivea for men, which is a skincare range um, advert which goes on. And usually that would be with players contracted to separate image rights deals, I would think, because they would effectively be able, Liverpool would be able to control their ability, those players' ability to be able to endorse in a club context too. Um, thank you for that. Um explanatory note um boot deals um in your answer you also touched on them and how how wide they might be interpreted and the conflicts that may arise between the player as to whether they are appearing um in their personal capacity in 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 in, in a, a representative capacity for the club or even for some players in a representative capacity for the national team. How do such um, deals be structured? Because you also mentioned issues of conflict of interest. And I guess one, one of the examples that one may think of where a player possibly um, may have contracted with a, a, a particular um, and, uh, company is... Diabala, where he sold his image rights to a private company and the private company controls them. And at the time, he's still in Juventus. If he's to make a move to the EPL, which, I mean, you can touch on the belief as to why his move to Tottenham failed. How do players, agents, and sports lawyers on the deals deal with that um, issue of conflict of interest when trying to procure boot deals, sponsorship for a player because it's an extra ending stream and the football career is very short. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. I think the easiest way that I look at it, especially in the book that I know we've, we've talked about at length as well before, is 
for, for everyone listening and watching to, to consider that what we're talking about are three levels of types of endorsement or relative endorsement. If you think about the player's personal endorsements without any club context whatsoever, his, his or her personal right to be able to endorse a particular product. Then we have the player's um, uh, club context, which is him or her uh, wearing um, the club kit and apparel and training kit and everything else when he or she plays in a club context. And then we have the international setting where he or she, again, is, is wearing um, kit, training gear and the rest and T-shirts, whatever else it may be, when that player is on um, international duty. Now, what you can see sometimes is uh, when players, I'm trying to give the example, are completely aligned across brand. So Gareth Bale or Harry Kane is the example. Bale okay, is... Well adidas he is real madrid adidas and he is wales adidas harry kane individual boot deal nike spurs nike and england nike as it goes now <clears throat> ronaldo and messi are the two exceptions to the rule where they are adidas nike but then switch for their own club where they're where uh, messi being adidas adidas is barcelona nike but then argentina adi and uh, Ronaldo is Juventus Adi, individual Nike, and then Portugal, Portugal Nike as well. So they don't have complete brand alignment. But when we're also thinking about the other types of deals that then can happen, there can't, um, a, um, a club cannot stop a player entering into a boot deal with anyone that they want to, the, the player wants to enter a boot deal with, even if it's a competitor of their own club shirt deal the same in the international setting but what can happen is that if the player has subsequent secondary types of endorsement deals let's say a car deal or a skincare deal or you know uh, other types of um, brand deals that conflict with or potentially conflict with the club partners then that is the type of arrangement that would go into a club player image rights deal to say you cannot endorse a partner of existing partner of and you the players image rights company need to get our the club's consent before you enter into a subsequent deal so that that's the type of dynamics and how things tend to work um brand brand alignment um, which you mentioned at the top of your your, your answer neymar is what, another one Mbappe is another one that's brand aligned. Um, does brand alignment play any role in club um, in player club transfers? You think of Bale, who's currently brand um, aligned. As would he consider a move to, for example, Manchester United as as compared to a Chelsea or Tottenham better because of that brand alignment and um, the tier where the club would be. Um, according to that brand? It's, it, so it's a good point there. I think the short answer is no, and not necessarily, because ultimately any boot deal is not going to be as valuable as the global uh, wages and salary that the player would be on uh, and earning um, uh, for, in their employment contract, full stop. So that, that's the first thing to note. But um, there are always two things to bear in mind. I haven't seen it in a deal, but I, I can't. Uh, I can't imagine that might. The, I can't imagine that there wouldn't necessarily be this clause where, for example, if Nike was um, uh, uh, has entered into a deal with Adidas uh, with uh, with Liverpool, for example, you know, there, there might be the possibility that if, for example, there's a clause which is negotiated which says if you Liverpool in the next five years sign any of these named players or players that are in the top Nike band category then we will activate those play individual players by providing x amount more marketing spend uh, bonus additional bonus to the club for example I, I i can't rule that out i haven't seen those type of deals before but it would sound logical that if players and very high profile players are completely brand aligned that would help considerably the flip side of that also is that in a player's boot deal just as you alluded to just at the end of your answer, clubs are 
defined in particular categories. So if you are um, a, a Nike player playing at Barcelona, a Nike boot player playing at Barcelona, it is likely you're in the highest category um, in order to receive the top remuneration for Nike playing at Barcelona. But if you, uh, as the player, would then transfer out of Barcelona and let's just say go to Chelsea, it is pretty likely they are in a lower category, even though it's still a Nike category, which means that your boot deal automatically reduces in value because of the club caliber. And the same is also true if you went from somewhere like, let, let's just say, Arsenal, Adidas, up to Juventus, it's likely that Juventus would be in a higher boot category in order to, for the player to receive a larger amount than if he were to stay at Arsenal and be on probably a tier, two, ca tier category two or three or whatever else it might be amount. So the point being is that sometimes there may be clauses in the overall br uh, brand club deal and there will almost certainly be clauses in the boot player deal which would fluctuate up or down depending on certain transfer circumstances. Um, that... Um moves me to my next question. Um, this particularly involves agents. Um, how is it important to find the right brand for your player? Because most of these boot deals or endorsement deals would sit at most usually than not have um, matching rights um, for the brand. So how do you position um, 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 your client to to the brand and the particular brand that they want. I mean, one of the examples that I think you or someone else speaks about is the Masood Ozil when you wanted to switch to Nike um, in the past. How important is it to find a brand that aligns to your players, um, what your player has interest in? But just before yep. you answer, um, to everyone that has questions, there is a... a, 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 a an icon at the bottom with a question mark. Can you please type in your questions there? Because as we talk and discuss and people keep joining in, your questions move up and they become difficult to find. I see someone says he has mixed um, arguments about the conflict that may arise between the player and club sponsorship. But going back to that, how do agents position their client in a way, in a manner that would attract the brand? Because ultimately, the brand is looking for a player that will sell their product. It, it's a great question, and um, I think my my initial answer is the vast majority of uh, football players don't have any other brands that they probably work with outside of their boot deal, just because you know uh, it might well be that either. Um, they're more concentrating on their on-field stuff. It might be that their on-field football agent doesn't have fantastic connections in the commercial sphere. Or it might just be that they're not that interested, interesting to brands because they don't have a big social presence or you don't know what they're actually interested in. And the reason why I say all of that is what tends to work best in my experience of working with a number of footballers and quite a few commercial agencies is it's exactly the point you mentioned, which is you've got to work out, these agencies have got to work out long term about why, um, why and what interests the players have so that the, the brand alignment is more than just transactional. It is authentic. Um, so if it is, for example, outside of the boot deal, um, is a player interested in um, political issues? Are they interested um, in ecological issues? Are they interested in global warming, climate change? Do they, are they interested in fashion? Do they want to um, uh, say their piece about a particular issue, for example, Rashford, that um, he talked about in terms of changing governmental policy? Um, the point generally being is that it's very difficult in the short term for any player to get across authentically what they're interested in and for brands to align with them straight away. It's very much a medium to long term play. And a lot of the time, a lot of players will just either say, well, I'll take the reactive deals that come in if it just so happens that a brand manages to contact the agent and then they do some type of um, deal. But the truth is, is that a lot of the time, players have misaligned valuations 
they are misaligned and agents are sometimes misaligned because they believe that their on pitch value is sh is and should be similar to their off field value and that just can't necessarily be the case. They may be very talented individuals on the pitch, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, nuanced, um, uh, complex um, brand um, individuals that can immediately be able to sell a good or product and know how best to market themselves as a brand out to brands. So that's almost my short answer, which is usually there's not a huge number of players that have large um, brand um, deal, a large amount of brand deals outside of the boot deals, but you can see the types of players that have a very well orchestrated, strategized plan um, for engaging their interests authentically, and then to be able to go out to brands and say, "This is this is what I am. This is what I stand for, and that's why our brand and myself and you align well with what you and everybody else wants to do." Um, club entitlement to a player's um, commercial value or clubs would say at the end of the day you become marketable because you play for us and it is rumoured that certain clubs Chelsea for example takes 50% of the players endorsement deals where, where other teams may not um, when and you also mentioned it in one of your answers where you say the player must get consent with the club taking 50% and you can mention um, what, what commission a, an agent gets from um, uh, endorsement deals, commercial deals. What does the player make? You know, is there, is there even a use for players to get into those commercial deals? Because the club takes 50%. You'll mention how much the agent takes or, and what is the player left with from that deal? So it's important to get the context right with a lot of this is that I, I can't speak for any particular club as to what they take or don't take in certain ways. I've seen different amounts and different deals for some of the top uh, EPL clubs. In those instances, what's important to note is that if a club is going to take a particular percentage of a player's endorsement deals, it is usually because in some instances they have become the exclusive agent for the player's personal image rights. And if that is the case, sometimes they will pay an additional premium to the player in order to have those rights. So if that's the case, and then they find a very good deal for the player, then they may say, well, here's the deal, but we're taking a higher percentage because we have already provided you effectively with an advance. You have to set a, a, a minimum return for us. And up until that minimum return, we'll take most of that. But after that, then we revenue share or split, for example. So without the context of that, it's difficult to explain that point. But clubs can take particular percentages from personal um, uh, endorsement deals. Now, the, the, the typical traditional approach to endorsement deals is that generally agents and commercial agents will take 20% of any player endorsement deal, obviously leaving the play with 80%. That's obviously different to the on-field commission, which tends to be a lot lower, i.e. between 3 to 5 and 10%, and particularly on the, on the continent. So um, it's usually, I saw one of the questions a little bit ago, that the off-field commission is usually larger because the off-field commission is significantly less Whereas the on-field commission tends to be higher, which means, sorry, the on-field amount tends to be higher, which means that the on-field commission is then less as a result. Um, moving on to representation contracts between the player and the agent. Um, exclusivity is important to ensure that the agent um, is managing both the on-field um, um, interest of the player and commercial interest. Just like in the UK, there's a um, two-year limitation in South Africa. What I tend to be asked a lot, especially after having discussions with you, is termination clauses in representation contracts. Most representation contracts are drafted by the agent and usually players just sign. What clauses can a player um, try add into the representation contract particularly to deal with performances or non-performances or maybe 
the relationship doesn't work the agent promises x and doesn't deliver is there are there any objective factors of determining performance or non performance from an agent in the two years it's very difficult is the answer i think it's a great question the short answer is there's always <laughs> performance KPIs that you could put in a contract like for example if you if you the agent haven't found me three commercial deals and a particular potential transfer within the first of our contract then i the player have the right to be able to terminate this contract on 30 days notice for example it may also be that even more straightforward is that the player has um a termination by way of convenience clause which is i at any time can terminate this contract on 30 or 60 days notice regardless of the reason i i don't need a reason to be able to terminate the truth is is that a lot of players are not in a strong enough position usually to be able to request that type um of clause um which then leaves um, a difficult situation in the in england in particular for reasons maybe we can talk about at another time where um players unless they can demonstrate that there's been a material breach of contract of the representation contract which then gives the player the grounds to terminate um it's pretty difficult to get out of a representation contract um and therefore the player either has to stick with the contract for a particular period of time or in the opposite um try and come to an agreement with their existing agent which says I will give you a the player will give you a particular percentage of any next deal that I sign with when I sign a new representation contract with a new agent but otherwise you know the agent has very little incentive to um to go and um uh, allow that termination um speaking on your last point especially um obviously I might ask you to take an advisory role um for small for for young and upcoming agents new agents trying to get into the market is is the space for agents to try work with other agents and trying to move their players it's always the case um so a lot of the time um agents might not actually be um might not a, a lot of agents don't players is the truth but what they do have is very good club side relationships so that if a club is selling a player for example for a certain amount of money the club will say to that agent look here's a mandate to be able to sell this player in a particular territory um or for these particular clubs um and then there will usually be incentive points like for example if we were then to um uh pay over a certain amount of money to be able to receive uh let's just say let's just say the club was happy to receive 10 million pounds but if they received anything over 10 million pounds then that agent could for example take 20% of the excess and that would be a way to be able to incentivize the agent to be able to find a club willing to pay over the 10 million pound mark euro mark that that selling club would want to do so it's pretty um common for um agents who might not even necessarily have uh players to be able to act as brokers on deals and and that's that's certainly the case but you've got to have those strong relationships with the clubs um staying on an advisory note tip um social media um clubs players are becoming more influential in that space more than players i actually went through um a certain player in south africa on his twitter following um only two clubs in the premier division in south africa have more following than him on instagram on twitter which i was very shocked now how do you advise players um to interact with what what social media with fans um because freedom of expression you you also mentioned um earlier on Rashford being very vocal about um um his project um Mesut Ozil was also in a situation a few years ago um Sterling is very vocal um on um race issues in 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 the UK in football um what what advice would you give to soccer players um agents trying to come into the industry about their use of social media um with caution is always the is always the truth um you know most of the players will have commercial and social media companies working with them 
to be able to uh, decide what their messaging will be in certain ways, S simple as that. But what, what that means in practice is that I see it with lots of some of the clients that I work with, you know, those those players won't be interacting with individuals per se online, usually, usually. Um, it will sometimes be the social media company, agent, agency, that um, will probably be filtering a lot of those messages because no one in their right mind will want to see the type of negativity that usually gets um, spewed out to anybody in the limelight generally by people across the social media spheres. And then in a way, you've got to look at the advantages of what social media can bring, which is a direct portal, a direct voice to everybody um, and make it broad and wide and get the tone of that message right rather than the usual traditional approach, which would have had to have been TV interview or um, post or pre-match interview or journalist interview. Now there is that direct means of communication. So um the, the 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 summary really there is is that a lot of players will will control their social media accounts to a degree but at the same time it will be a lot more nuanced than just a player having his smartphone or her smartphone and deciding how to use it and when to use it or otherwise there will almost certainly be a structured strategic approach to how to put particular messages across at certain times and how really to filter out the abusive noise which is pretty vehement sometimes it can be a lot of the time um the last issue that i'd like to touch on um i think we've unpacked the industry upside down in 2015 um fifa took a decision to really change the agency space um, it opened up the industry. Um, other people criticized that decision by saying you opened up the industry to anybody and anyone and you exposed soccer players or footballers to people who just come in and say they are agents, they know what they're doing. And, 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 and to a certain extent, that has also played a part in developing a bad name for agents. And the uh, proposed um, uh, re new regulations um, that will regulate agents, intermediaries as FIFA calls them, there is the reintroduction of the licensing system wherein agents or aspirant agents um, will have to take a test. And apparently the test didn't have a high pass mark previously. How is that going to change the industry, one? But also, are you for that? Is, are you supporting that? Is it, is it going to close up the industry? Is it going to make it a monopoly? What are your, your opinions on that? My view in uh, any type of industry where effectively uh, someone will have fiduciary duties towards their client is that there, there needs to be a certain minimum standard and threshold that um, individuals which have a lot of power to be able to adhere to. So my first view is it's right and proper that there should be a reintroduction of licensing at the FIFA level. I think that's right. Um, I think there should be an exam that agents have to pass. They, sh they, they should have to understand how the regulations work in detail. They should have un to understand how particular conflicts and issues like that um, infringe or rather impact on their behaviours and such. Um, uh, and it will inevitably wholesale reduce the numbers of intermediaries uh, worldwide. Um, I, I, you know, my view on that is, is that it's vital that the right people advise the players generally. And I think those that would have to study hard, would have to put real legwork in, it's important that those are the right people um, with the right skill set and knowledge to be able to, to do that. And I think also regulating it at the FIFA level is a much more efficient process than regulating it as it currently at national associate football association level because otherwise agents potentially need numerous and multiple licenses to work in various football association uh, jurisdictions which is highly inefficient and i think needs and i think needs and is being reconciled so the 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 fifa presentation that was given i think last week um suggested that the new regulations might be published um uh, around this time if not a little bit later next year 2021 um with a view then to the regulations effectively coming into force soon after um after that point with a little bit of transition as well so 
it's it's extremely likely very soon um, that agents will have to study to pass an exam, even maybe existing agents that already had licenses pre-2015 to a degree. And also, if I was, for example, wanting to do agency activity, I don't do that at the moment. Um, I help the agents with particular legal drafting. Then I would have to pass the exam potentially as well. But I think the point generally is, you know, higher sets of regulation, higher levels of understanding the industry and the regulations um, and um, uh, what everything that goes into being an agent is, is certainly, um, you know, a positive. Um, as Daniel would say, the short answer is, Study I the really for regulations, I, study I the people well. regulations, and yeah, get in touch with and know what's happening with the laws of football, the football laws, and you might be better positioned for when the new regulations come in to continue practicing as an agent. But one last thing, um, before I deal with uh, questions from the viewers, you mentioned a fiduciary role. Should agents, when this um you one one system is for this licensing system is formed should agents have a insurance um fund you know as a lawyer there is a fiduciary fund that you would have um should agents have that fund as well well i think they should at least have mandatory insurance requirements so i think that's my short answer there which is uh maybe they don't necessarily need a fund if you're saying particular commission parts should go into a solidarity fund then that's something for probably fifa to to think about there but i think ultimately yes uh, as well as having uh, passing the exam there should probably be some type of mandatory insurance um, to ensure that um, if agents do give bad advice or otherwise and players were to sue that then um, you know players could get recourse and potential compensation as a result all right um the questions are here the first one oh yes um the first one is are this chat going to be available afterwards yes um i will post them on igtv um the second question that i have here is what is the club's right on what a player can post or not post on social media? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, usually, um, the player will already have had to have signed up to a type of code of conduct. And usually, there will also be a social media policy for players to adhere to. And if they don't adhere to that, then depending on the, st the contractual structure, they may have disciplinary proceedings brought against them by the club under their employment contract. But there may also be um, clauses in the player's image rights contract, which don't, which uh, effectively prohibit um, the player and or the image rights company behaviour, which would bring either the club into disrepute or devalue the, pl the club's image um, in the, the wider media space, for example. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, I'm gonna uh, join this join these two questions. Firstly, would you recommend creating a sponsorship portfolio for your player? And um, can clubs base their attraction on players based on how much marketable they are? So, will clubs go for more marketable or players in the market when they sign their players? I think the second answer there is not usually is the answer. I, I don't know of too many players that are signed because of their marketability. I know the players are usually signed on their on-field capabilities, full stop. But if there are two players that are of equal standard, one has a bigger um, commercial presence that might help the club in different ways, then that's obviously quite a, an important value add. Um, I think the first question is a difficult one because ultimately the, the, the question isn't about the individual agent, it's about the individual player. So the player, there's plenty of players, as you know, that um, uh, are world-class players but don't have big brands around them because they're not interested in endorsing lots of different companies and brands and opportunities. They are only interested in their on-field uh, work and their training and uh, and their families maybe or particular interests and not getting involved in that type of fear. So, you know, ultimately it's down to the player. But if the player is interested, then it's ultimately the, the opportunity for the agents to cultivate those particular interests and passions in order to convert them into brand relationships. Um, the next question, okay, I'm going to join this too as well. 
um what are the effects of brexit what effects will brexit have on the e- on epl football um and also do you think the newcastle take over will go through if not is there any vehicle for miss steverly who might be able to use not or he's not directly linked to saudi arabia um but just to move on just to broaden the question more um so that it's a bit more relevant to the south african market as well uh newcastle buying uh the takeover that's um rumored or reported to be happening at newcastle how will that affect um financial fair play uh remind me what the first question was again just uh <laughs> brexit the first brexit, question is yeah. brexit and then the second question um is in line with newcastle and i'm just adding in an ffp um issue there good i'm i'm glad you're keeping me uh keeping me busy so um <laughs> the, the first there is brexit is a very difficult one um because it depends on a number of factors if there is a no deal brexit that obviously complicates things significantly because um uh the the default position might well then be that anybody that is not a uk citizen um may require a work permit um so th- those type of nuances need to be uh, sorted out it is also going to be the case that under 18 players can't potentially transfer to uh, uk clubs because there was a fifa regulation exemption to uh, 16 year old plus is being able to join other um clubs and other member states when uh britain are no longer in europe and no longer a, a european member state then that uh, exemption will no longer um benefit british clubs or english clubs uk clubs um yeah. second question newcastle take over the reports are that because the saudi government has very close links with the sovereign fund and because of the piracy dispute between qatar and saudi arabia that there is there would be in theory be an issue about the individuals looking to what the individuals that have been appointed by the saudi sovereign fund might not pass the what was previously the fit and proper test which is the owners and directors test because there is a prohibition against um uh being involved in pirated uh, issues generally so at the moment the owners and directors test is being um reviewed by i believe uh, numerous individuals at the premier league to understand whether the saudi sovereign fund would pass and the individuals controlling the fund would pass that test and the reports are that they probably will um even though there is quite a damning uh, wto world trade organization report about the dispute between um qatar and um saudi uh, the saudi pirated broadcaster um and how that will impact on ffp um what it was reported a while back in a, in the athletic um online um 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 paper um was that because newcastle had made profits in previous years for epl sustain cost control and sustainability the, the profitability regulations that they would have more leeway to be able to spend because they'd be able to effectively subsidize the previous um profits against then future losses that they'd be able to make now if newcastle at some point in the future was to make was to make a play for europe then they would obviously have to comply with the uefa regulations the fair play regulations but at the moment more of the issue is probably probably looking to comply with the premier league regs and then at a light le- a slightly later stage then complying um with uh, with uefa regs uh all right um daniel thank you for this three part series um i believe it was very educational for everybody that manages to join in from the start until the end to those who got pieces um for certain episodes i'll try upload all three episodes on my ig tv um peer pressure has gotten to me and i've been forced to really go into that market um but i appreciate you taking your time you know over the past few weeks to talk to me to educate the south african market to educate me um exchange ideas any education mate you know you know as much as me you're just making me you're making me look good by asking the good questions <laughs> i'm your graduate you spoke about this i'm your graduate so i was very confident to 
ask my lecturer out for coffee on a public space and he he was kind enough to really accept the 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 offer and the invite and for that it really means a lot to me um i think um footballers that were able to join football administrators that were able to join um aspiring football players um will make better decision in this in the space chinedu okolo before i move on is really asking me this question um what can we do to help south african players that want to play overseas on a legal side so it's actually someone putting me on the spot what can we do to help south african players move overseas well um i think the short answer is there's plenty of um uh data on every, on players throughout the world now which is a great thing um you know super sport taking care of the south african market as well and other broadcasters i think it's sabc as well covering the, the is who who covers the domestic um uh the domestic um league here is it the national broadcaster or is it super sport still or was it super sports super sports still um so the national broadcaster still broadcasts there's a particular arrangement between the three parties the yeah. league yeah super sport and the national broadcaster So I think a lot of it will be, you know, players that can graduate from the domestic league into the international team. Um and then once the international team um excels, does better, creates that structure, then um it's easier for those players to be able to come uh, to European markets because they have played for their national team um, as well. So and then there there are easier European markets to go to so for example Portugal and Belgium and some of the Scandinavian countries are easier for non-EU workers to be able to move to rather than countries like sometimes like um Italy or the UK um or France for example. So um what what I think is the important thing is usually to be able to increase the the quality level in the domestic league which then feeds the national team which then demonstrates that the national team can have a period of success or can bring through a number of good talented players and then it's having the 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 agents either in the european side or on the south african side to be able to engage with those footballers to make those opportunities possible um thank you i'm pressed for time uh, i think i'm left with four minutes but somebody says i missed their question so um let me try to find it sure. um the there are best players who are um what is what is the club's right i asked this question um what can agents do for african players moving abroad i think your answer just touched on that um yeah, yeah i think i i i think i've i've touched you on did your, all did the... your job. you did your job as the question master that's the most important thing <laughs> yeah i think i touched on all the questions that were asked um But yeah thank you um we appreciate it like i said and hopefully in the near future we 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 will daniel can i please ask you for 15 minutes after this one cuz a few people are saying i missed their questions so hey, well, what i'm going to ask and what i'm going to ask everyone yeah. to do let's do one next sunday night and we can get some pre questions done so then we can get straight into everybody's questions maybe they can put the questions to you beforehand and then we can do like a whole just q and a session for 15 minutes half an hour maybe thank you thank you thank you i told people this was the grand this was the fa- finale um there's a season finale but yeah but i just end myself another one see you much. next week next too time much to- good yeah No thank you Daniel for your for your kindness. See everyone next week. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again. Take care. That's